pierced side. Many stigmatics have attracted huge bands of followers. Some have become saints, others have been denounced as heretics or frauds. Behind the religious phenomenon lies a fascinating medical mystery that doctors are still trying to untangle. Mexico. Preacher Lucy Rael heads home for a unique celebration of Easter. You're tuned to KKIT Taos, New Mexico, 1340 on your AM radio dial. This is Evangelist Lucy Rael reminding you that I will be coming home to the Bethel Deliverance Church in Taos for two great Easter services on Sunday, April the 22nd at 5 a.m. in the morning and 7 p.m. at night. Remember all the marks of Christ's crucifixion appear in my body at this time. Come and be... For Lucy Ryle, these Easter services in Taos bring a break from her missionary tours of America and a chance to show family and followers at home the stigmata which never failed to appear on the anniversary of the crucifixion. Hi, Brian. How are you? During Easter time, all the marks appear in my body. That is, the, an imprint of crown of thorns comes upon my forehead, and I also get the nail prints on my hands, and then I get the nail prints on my feet, and that also goes from top to bottom of my feet, and I get the stripes on my back, and I get a wound on my side, uh, the same side that Jesus was pierced. Uh, during the time of the crucifixion. My daughter also, Angelica, uh, the stigmata appears in her body also. Angelica was just three weeks old when she first showed the signs. Her wounds mimicked her mother's. At every church, Lucy packs in the people. They come to witness the stigmata and enjoy her spectacular brand of evangelism. Led by Lucy, the worshippers work themselves into a frenzy. Yet the evening's emotional high is still to come. Hallelujah. I want some of you people to just come up to the front and help pray for just a few moments. Apparently, quite suddenly, the wounds in Lucy's hands begin to open. My God, the blood is coming. Come on and praise the Lord. Lucy believes the stigmata are a sign that she has the power of healing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, in the name of Jesus, I claim a miracle right now. Lord, that you will just touch her right now. That you will just heal her right now. God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, give her a miracle right now. In the name of Jesus, somebody take care of that woman. Thank you, Jesus. Are you the male, Rabbi? Are you the madam? The faithful accept the stigmata without question. To them, there is certain miracle. And though there are skeptics, Lucy is serene in her conviction that the wounds are a gift from God. A lot of people uh, may actually say that this is a fraud or they don't believe, but uh, we can't uh, force anyone uh, to believe, you know. Everyone has the right to their belief. We know that there's not everybody's going to believe, and all I can do is just pray. Well, we just love them all. We love the believers and we love the unbelievers, so we just love everyone and we just pray for them. The first to show stigmata was St. Francis of Assisi. His wounds appeared in 1224. In 1375, St. Catherine of Siena claimed rays of light from a crucifix burned into her hands, feet and chest. German Anne Catherine Emmerich suffered from the stigmata for 13 years, every Easter until she died in 1824. 
For four years, from 1899, Italian Gemma Galgani bled every week on Thursdays and Fridays. From the 1920s to the 50s, Therese Neumann relived the crucifixion every weekend in Connorsreuth, Germany. Blood flowed copiously from her face, feet and chest. But fellow German Otto Muck from Berlin failed to impress the experts in the 1930s. They said his wounds were self-inflicted. And the claims of this woman, Italian Giliola Giorgini, have fared just as badly. Wounds on her arms, which she said were stigmata, brought her fame, followers and riches, including this luxurious villa near Rome. But in 1984, the religious order she'd founded was exposed as a front for corruption. Giliola Giorgini was jailed for 10 years. The stigmata of Maria de Conceição from Portugal are still being investigated by doctors. While a self-styled Pope, Clemente Gomez, uses his stigmata to attract vast congregations to his cathedral in southern Spain. But the most venerated stigmatic of modern times was Padre Pio. His wounds appeared in 1918 and bled for half a century. Each day before dawn, huge crowds queued to hear him say mass. When the church doors were opened, pilgrims jostled for the best view of the man they revered as a saint. Pio was credited with miracles of healing. He was said to have the gift of prophecy. But it was the wonder of the stigmata that brought the worshippers in their hundreds of thousands to see him. In the place where he lived and preached, San Giovanni Rotondo, a town grew up, complete with one of Italy's finest hospitals. A major center of pilgrimage where once there had been only a primitive friary. Padre Pio was in the Friary Chapel in September 1918, praying in front of the crucifix, when the stigmata first appeared. He was actually sitting over in this first place, in the gallery, making his thanksgiving after Mass. The actual physical stigmatation seems to have come about in this way, that from the resurrected body of Christ, which was in front of Padre Pio on that uh, 20th of September 1918 from the spot of the crucifixion on our Lord's resurrected body came rays of light which a Dublin doctor explained to me as signs of energy they crossed the room and went over to Father Pio and opened the secret wounds which had been on his body for eight entire years that's all we know the relics of Padre Pio's stigmata are preserved in his cell in the friary Here's the window that Father Pio would wave and bless from. His sandals on the floor in this case. The shoe size is actually a nine. But as you notice, the sandals are greatly enlarged by the shoemaker because of the swelling from the wounds in the feet. On the writing table, his books of meditation, his rosary, which he said constantly, all through the night and all through the day a plastic box holding the chips of crusted blood which would fall from his hands when he'd take off his gloves to celebrate mass. Here are the gloves in the corner of the desk which looks like a small handkerchief folded in half stained by the blood that would come out from the wound that went through his heart. Soon after the stigmata first appeared, Padre Pio hid his hands from the public gaze, except during mass when the bleeding wounds could be glimpsed. One of the few to see them at close quarters was Monsignor Michael Buckley. Because I was a student and studying for the priesthood, I was given the special privilege of serving his mass. And before mass he had mittens and he used to take these mittens off. And then he had a very long hour that covered his hand. Now as a server, I was kneeling behind him and so his hand was between me and the candle. And when he lifted up his hands to pray, the alb fell back from his hands and you could see the light of the candle through his hands as if uh, it was filled with blood. Padre Pio's assistant was shocked by the wounds. I had prayed to see them, but unfortunately when I saw them, it looks like a lepr leprous hand. I said, God, don't let me see them again. 
While applying a soothing bandage to his chest, Father Alessio also saw the wound in his side. Not uh, uh, that I made a trick on him, but I tried to unbutton the, the thing. I did. And put, you know, the, uh, the bandage, cool bandage on, on here. But at the same time, I pulled out the, the dress and I saw a wound here, right down here, was so large with a crossed, but not bleeding. Just a cross across here. And that's why I saw the wounds on his side. Padre Pio died in 1968. More than 100,000 people attended his funeral. The doctors who had examined Padre Pio in his lifetime pronounced his stigmata medically inexplicable. And his death brought no solution. Post-mortem photographs of his hands showed barely a trace of the wounds of 50 years. His side showed only a fine scar. His feet were completely healed. Today, in Manfredonia, near San Giovanni, this man, the devil's advocate, is charged with assessing the life of Padre Pio. Don Antonio D'Amico is a member of a Vatican tribunal, which will decide whether Padre Pio should be beatified, the first step to sainthood. The tribunal, presided over by the Bishop of Manfredonia, examines witnesses who knew him in his lifetime. The questions are sent direct from the Vatican. But the one certain answer is that the mystery of Padre Pio's stigmata will remain as tantalizing and unsolved as it has done for half a century. A curious feature of stigmata is they usually occur in the wrong places. We know that the Romans crucified their victims by driving nails to their wrists, yet stigmatics bleed from the palms of the hands. Moreover, although the Bible says that Jesus was pierced in the side, it doesn't say which side. Some stigmatics bleed from the right, others from the left. They can't all be correct. What the wounds of stigmatics do match are those shown in the pictures and crucifixes in their own churches. This strongly suggests that stigmata are produced not by knives or fingernails, as some skeptics have claimed, but by a much sharper instrument, the human mind. Here is an even more striking example from the medical literature. It involves a British officer in World War II. While unconscious and under heavy sedation, he developed deep rope marks around his wrists under the very eyes of the doctors. It turned out that many years before, he'd been a sleepwalker and so he had been tied to his bed to prevent him from wandering around. Now, if the unconscious mind can create anything as specific as rope marks on the skin, then surely it can also produce stigmata. Oakland, California. The New Light Baptist Church. Loretta Robertson is famed far beyond the boundaries of her parish. The first recorded non-white and non-Catholic stigmatic her case is unique. The stigmata first appeared when she was 10 and already an active member of the New Light Baptist Church. Her hands bled during services. She became a celebrity. Reporters asked her if it made her feel special. Mm, it's special, but I want to like, treat me like a king and a queen, though. Later, at Emory High School, the wounds opened up during a maths lesson with teacher Anthony Burris. Coco began to bleed out of her hands. I mean, it was really just puddles of blood. And so I took a white piece of typing paper and I just scooped it up. And here it is. And I just put it in the vial. And of course, over the years, it has dried some, but 
there it is. The violin. Here are the, that's the actual print right there. So I just took her out of the classroom and we went into the principal's office and I asked permission to show her hands to the classes. She walked in his office and opened her hands and he was just spellbound. He said, go ahead. Almost every classroom we went, when she opened her hands, it was silence. She also bled from her forehead, as though she'd been wearing a crown of thorns like Christ on the cross. At home in suburban Oakland, Claretta's mother, Alice, was amazed and alarmed when her daughter first began to bleed with the stigmata. I saw the blood come from her hands. I saw the blood come from her feet. I saw the blood come from her right side. And I saw the blood screaming, pointing in her face. But it took me a long time to really believe that it was what they said it was stigmata, you know. And I said, why my child? Loretta's mother took her to visit the paediatric clinic. Light, you see that? Okay. Dr. Loretta Early remembers the blood flowing from the child's hand. Oh, that looks perfect. And she took a film of it. I observed this blood to somewhat well up in the center, open area of about one centimeter, and spread out to the palmar creases, and then stop over about three to five minutes. The blood then coagulated and I wiped that blood off and for a few minutes I saw a circular slightly bluish area in the center of the palm of the hand and this disappeared. After taking a 10 powered lens it was somewhat disappointing that I could find no place where she was bleeding from. It was significant that uh, the, during the week prior to this onset uh, she was reading a book called Crossroads by John Webster, a book that I was familiar with, and it was a book about the crucifixion and the agony which Christ went through. And it's a, a very emotional book of, of the agony during those last few hours that Christ was on earth. Claretta identified closely with Christ's suffering, Dr. Early concluded. The intensity of her feelings might have caused her to bleed in sympathy. The doctors could offer no other explanation. There was nothing medically unusual about her. The blood was her own and normal. For the past 10 years, the pastor and his precious parishioner have wondered why she was chosen to bear the stigmata. I've often wondered, well, why me? You know, why not one of my sisters? Or why not one of my brothers? But he did, too, chose me. There are a lot of people that don't believe that there's a God or Jesus. And I think he did it to show people that there is a God. As Claretta has grown older, living with a stigmata has become more of a strain. I was out to dinner with a friend, and um, this is the second time this has happened. And we were just sitting there, Major Dia brought our food. We're sitting there getting ready to eat. And I go to put my napkin across my lap, and the blood just starts pouring out of my hand. Now, usually it would web up. This day, it poured out, like something like you're just pouring something out of a glass. That's the way the blood came out of my hand. I couldn't explain it to anyone. You know, I could do anything but sit there and rush to the bathroom, you know. When it first started, there was no pain just the bleeding, you know. But as I got older, I started to experience pain, you know, in my hands like someone is sticking something and driving something through my hands. It's a horrible feeling. <laughs> the latest in a line of specialists to investigate Claretta Stigmata is psychiatrist Dr. David Agel. He met her before church on Easter Day. After hearing her story, Agel asked permission to hypnotize Claretta. He wanted to see how readily she responded to suggestion. She went out like a light. This convinced Agel that Claretta's mind could influence her body to an exceptional degree. She could use this technique to control the stigmata, if she wished, with a little self-hypnosis. 
little bit more awake, not completely. But what I want you to remember now is this, that when you wish to do this for yourself, you can look at any small object of your choice in a private, quiet place, count slowly to 10, and by the time you reach 10, and you'll be in this very comfortable, relaxed state, but you will also have the ability, through this concentration, to keep it away if you want to. It's something that you can use for yourself. It will be your choice from now on. This Easter, the New Light congregation was not treated to a display of stigmata. Could it be that Claretta can at last control the strange powers of her mind? She is not someone who clearly is seeking pain and punishment. However, what we do know more about is that she does have a very severe kind of conscience. She is has a strong sense of guilt if she feels that she does not do things right for other people. Now, she is a very good hypnotic subject, and that indicates that she has certain powers of concentration that many people do not have, and that is that she can use concentration to go into a trance state and perhaps to influence her body in various ways. The hope is now that she will use some of that powers for her benefit as opposed to in any way that is harmful to her. Are stigmatics genuine? Yes, I believe that many of them are. Whatever the medical explanation, stigmata dramatically demonstrate the almost miraculous power of religious faith. Tomorrow at 7.30, Arthur C. Clarke tells some spooky ghost stories.